Amen. Psalm 139. We're talking about who? God. Very good. I'm going to engage you tonight. I'm going to make you answer questions. Psalm 139. So, so far we've talked about God is creator. And because he's creator, God is the judge. Thank you, Melissa, for writing this down. The rest of you, take notes. Because God is the judge, God is also all what? Say it louder. Okay, we're still dealing with that one. Omnipotent, which means what? Omni and potent. Powerful, all powerful, almighty. Yes. And God is also all knowing, which is omniscient. Omniscient. God knows everything. Right? And then we were dealing with God is omnipresent. I thought you said president. I wouldn't mind God being president, but I'll settle for Trump. All right. Anyway, Psalm 139, 7. Uh, the Bible means, I think it's where we left off last week, but I got a couple things I want to show you. Take a look up on the screen right now. Look up there. What is that? Jared, what is that? What do you think it is? What does it look like? Not the best picture in the world. Huh? Just space. Space city. That's what it is. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay? Who would want to go live in space? Am I the only one in this whole church? John, are you with me? No? Now, see, I grew up watching the Saturn V rockets take those guys to the moon, all right? That was what I watched. I wanted to be an astronaut. I, I would go live, okay? But here's the neat thing. I'm going to. One of these days. All right, I'll get there in a minute. Psalm 139, 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, if I ascend up into heaven, Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. What is in God's right hand? The book. Always when you see God's right hand, always think of the book that's in God's right hand. That's, and by the way, there's, there's a, a strong hand and a weak hand. Everybody has one. And even God is displaying this when he, because God always talks about the, the power of his right hand. The right hand is where the book is. That's the scepter that God holds, but it's his divine authority. It's his book. All right. So anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's God's right hand that holds us, meaning it's the word of God that holds us. By the way, I'll throw this one in for free. I won't charge you for this little bit of knowledge, Brother George. You know how many bones are in your hand? If you were to take a guess, and it's not 66. 27. Exactly. 27 bones in your hand, and that's how many books are in the New Testament. Isn't that neat? So when they, when they laid the right hand on somebody, it was, the, it was a typology of the blessing of the new covenant. Not the old one, the new one, the new covenant. Isn't that neat? So what did, uh, what did Jacob do with Manasseh and Ephraim? Joseph brought Manasseh and Ephraim. He didn't kiss him. He laid his hands on them, conferring to them the blessing of the new covenant. In any way, that's neat. So verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So when it comes to God's omnipresence, God is everywhere at all times, past, 
present, future, every place that can be, God is there. All right? No matter how high or no matter how low. I mean, think about it. When, uh, if you look in Jonah, turn to Jonah chapter 2. Say Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Look where Jonah said he was. Joel, Amos, here it is. Jonah chapter 2. Then, uh, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of where? Hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. No matter what, and the, so the Bible means what it says. No matter how low you get, or no matter how low God takes you, he is always there with you, and he can hear your prayers no matter where you are, somebody say amen. Now turn over to Amos. Just a couple pages back, actually. I'm going to show you this. Amos chapter 9. Um, I ran across this. I, I knew about what was in Ob Obadiah chapter 1. But I ran across this in Amos chapter 9. While I was studying the issue of the heaven concerning whether or not the earth was flat or whether it was a globe. Because the flat earth model says that heaven is a hard shell glass dome over the earth and it's, it can never be penetrated. So what that means, and this is what the flat earth people say, they say that there are no satellites anywhere. Satellites do not exist. They say that every satellite company is lying to you and covering up the, the, the flat earth. So there's no, since there's no space, there can be no satellites. So all the satellite companies are lying to you. The guy that came out and hooked your satellite TV up was in on it because he had to aim that dish, right? They say, they say, Brother George, that those are balloons up there floating around. I know! You should have seen him laugh. I love it when he laughs. But anyway, here's my point, because I said that's not true. And of course, they say nobody's ever gone to space. There's no satellites. We never went to the moon. We did not send things out to go look at Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. No, nothing like that has ever happened, ever. And it's not possible to go into space because it's a hard shell dome over the earth. Well, look at Amos chapter 9. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar and he said, smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. And he that fleeth of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. And then that he said, though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So what did they try to do in Genesis 11? Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. So man was attempting to get there, all right? And I'll throw this one in too. The flat earth people say that there are no meteorites that fall from space to earth. Those are pieces of the hard shell dome that falls down and hits people. I'm, listen, when you, when you make up one lie, you've got to make up a whole bunch of others to cover up the one lie. It's what they say. So who had the idea that man would ascend up into heaven? God did. God said it. God said that that would happen. Now look at Obadiah. There's only one chapter in Obadiah, verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So we know when he says heaven, he's not just talking about the air above us. He's talking about space because he says that th though you set a nest among the stars, that would be outer space. God said, thence will I bring thee down. Now, 
the reason why I put that picture up there. The guy that owns Amazon.com, uh, Jeff Bezos, he is taking his whatever billions of dollars that he has and he is investing in his private company that, and he came out and made a speech on this a couple of weeks ago. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh, this is pretty cool. Because he said was, we're trying to go to Mars or we're trying to find planets that are around stars that are going to be impossible to get to. And he said, who said we had to live on a planet somewhere other than Earth? If man wants to escape Earth, who said we had to live on a planet? His idea was to build these space colonies. And he said we could put as many of them as we wanted to up there because there's a ton of space around the Earth. And he said we could build them, we could send them up there, we could live on them. And if you wanted to come back to Earth, you could come back to Earth. Now, my question is, why do you think, and they're serious about this, he's investing his money to start the process of man living in space. Now, aside from the fact that it's cool, it would be cool to live in space. Why would man want to do that? And I have a theory. And it goes like this. I believe God is going to judge this world. Amen? He's going to judge this earth. In fact, the book of Revelation, the last seven things that's going to be done in this world, God is going to pour out seven vials of wrath upon the earth. All right? So, I think that down in the deep recesses of Wicked man's heart is he thinks he can escape the wrath of God. Let me put it how, let me explain it how guys like Jeff Bezos and uh, Elon Musk, who owns PayPal, all these rich billionaires, they keep dreaming about how we can go to space and how we can live in space and do things in space. So here's what I think. They, they think or they know that at some point, some big cataclysm is going to happen to planet Earth. The, um, the polar ice caps are going to melt. Global warming, or is it global cooling? Or is it climate change? Or whatever it is, is going to cause these horrendous problems. And billions and billions of people are going to die. And Earth, or there's going to be a nuclear war. And Earth is going to become uninhabitable so we need to find a place off of earth to live so that's in their mind for sure but man has always sought about means to escape god's judgment i mean think of genesis chapter 3 the one of the things that satan said to eve was ye shall not surely die in other words, if you follow my plan, I'll give you a way to escape the wrath of God for disobedience to his commandments. And man is disobedient to God's commands. So I think these, Psalm 139, because he said, um, if I ascend up into heaven, that's one witness. Amos chapter 9, verse uh, 2, that's a second witness. If they climb up to heaven... And then Obadiah, verse um, 3, is a third witness, or verse 4 is a, a third witness. God is saying that man, at some point, is going to build a nest up in the stars. Well, we already have something like that. It's called the International Space Station. Okay? And it's the hope of mankind to escape off of this earth. So, here's what I'm saying. No matter how high man gets... God is not going to let him escape his wrath when he's ready to pour it out. Amen? See, so here's man trying to be smarter than God, higher than God, and more powerful than God. By trying to escape God's judgments and God's wrath. And we live in the age where man is on the brink of being able to do that. Man's going to try to change his DNA so he can become immortal. Thus... Changing the curse of Genesis chapter 3. God says, I'm going to put a stop to that. 
Man says, well, I'm going to build a city and a tower. He's taught me reaching to heaven. God put a stop to that. But man's going to try it again to build his nest among the stars. And God says, if you build the nest among the stars, which I think they're going to, God says, I'm going to bring from that point, I'm going to bring you back down to the earth. So I do absolutely believe that the earth sits all alone in the universe and is the focus of everything that God does. That's what I believe. Uh, now, go to, um, let's go here. Let's start out here. Go to, uh, look at Joshua 6. Joshua, no, Joshua 5. That's where I want you to go. Joshua chapter 5. So, God is the creator. God is uh, the, the judge. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is eternal or everlasting. God is omnipresent. So now we're going to look at God as being holy. Joshua chapter 5 is where we're going to start. Verse 13. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Guess who this man was? I believe this man was Jesus Christ. In verse 14, he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. This is why I believe it's Jesus. Angels, if you remember, John fell down and worshiped an angel. The angel said, get up. You don't worship, you don't worship me. So I believe this is Jesus. He fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. Joshua did so. What does that story sound like to you? Moses. Same, same scenario. Moses sees the, uh, the bush burning. Moses approaches it and he hears the voice of the Lord saying to him, Moses, put off thy shoes from thy feet for the ground wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moses now is in the presence of God. And in the presence of God is holiness. This is something that I think, especially a teaching that is lost in today's world because sin is so rampant and so many people are caught up in it. So many church people caught up in it. So many pastors caught up in it. So many deacons caught up in it, except for, of course, Brother Sterling. But so many people, I left John, sorry, I left you out, but so many people caught up in wickedness, in the church. So now, nobody teaches or preaches the holiness of God. The bottom line is, God will not and cannot be in the presence of sin, for God is holy. Somebody say amen. So let me run through these verses. Leviticus 19.2, you might want to jot these down. Keep up with your, in your Bible, I sort of try to go in order, so you know I'm going to go from left to right in your Bible. Leviticus 19.2, speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, notice this, ye shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. Now, there's two ways of looking at this one verse. Number one, you can look at it as a commandment, or a challenge where you personally strive to bring yourself to personal holiness. And I'll say to you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, the more that you love God, the more holy your life is going to be. And again, if you see this as a commandment, God says, ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 
You see it as a challenge. You see it as a goal every day in life. So let's say that you get up tomorrow morning and you say, you know what? I know the devil's, the moment I say this, the devil's going to try to get me. But I'm going to strive for my very best today to remain holy. Okay? So what would that mean? Number one, you wouldn't watch stuff on TV you'd normally watch. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Number two, you wouldn't listen to music on the way to work you would normally listen to. Number three, you wouldn't read stuff, whether it was in a book or a magazine or on the internet or whatever. You wouldn't read things that you would normally want to read. Uh, you wouldn't say things that you would normally want to say. You want your mouth, and I'm not just talking about dirty words. I'm talking about taking the Lord's name in vain. I'm talking about let no profane or vulgar thing come forth out of your mouth. I'm talking about don't lie. Quit telling lies. Quit spreading rumors or gossip. You want your mouth to be righteous and right with God along with the rest of your body. David said, I'd set my eyes on no unclean thing. So you make a covenant with your eyes. You're not going to look at things that are defiled. You're not going to look at things that are unholy. Your mind, you're going to try to make... Now, your mind, if your mind's like mine, it's going through a hundred thoughts every three seconds. Okay? Thinking it once, that's going to happen. But dwelling on it, you got a choice on that one. Amen? You, got a, you may not have a choice about where your mind wants to go throughout the day, but you've got a choice where it wants to sit down and hang around for a while. And I'm just saying there's not, you don't hear too much anymore about personal holiness. God's holy. God is a holy God and he sets a father's example to all of his children. This is the way I am. This is the way I want my children to be. Amen? But then, you look at this same verse another way. Not just as a commandment, but a blessing. It's like when God says, let there be light. What happens? There's light. So God says to you, four words, ye shall be holy. And when he says that to you, what happens when God's word goes out of his mouth? Never returns to him void. It always does what he sends it out to do. If God says to you, ye shall be holy. Then God, and four words there to me, that's four gospels. It is the imputed righteousness that God puts on us. Because the Bible says that man at his altogether best, is unclean. There is none righteous. No, not one. Now again, strive for personal holiness. There's nothing wrong with that. And you have a little bit of self-satisfaction that goes along with that. But then also you have God washing you, cleansing you. The very desire to want to be holy is evidence that God has put a new man on the inside of you anyway. Okay, by way of the cross. So it, no matter how you look at it, you know, I was, I apply that same idea to the Ten Commandments. There's going to come a time. Let me get there real quick. There's going to come a time when thou shalt not kill anymore. <laughs> Amen. Amen. There's going to come a time when thou shalt not steal. God is going to, what God said is going to take place in your life. One day or the next day, it's going to happen. But here's God saying, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And if God, if God is not holy, if God is not clean, if God is defiled, if God is corrupt, then you and I have no chance for personal holiness. What's it? We can strive for it all day long. We're, and we're always going to just miss the mark. There's always going to be some little defilement that just keeps us from reaching perfection. It's always going to be that way. So, this is what Christ did for us. In the replacement of us not being able 
to achieve 100% perfection and holiness, then the righteousness of Christ kicks in and makes us clean and makes us whole. Leviticus 21, 8, Thou shalt sanctify him therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I the Lord which sanctify you. There it is right there. I the Lord which sanctify you am holy. By the way, we have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, but He's also God the Word of God. It all goes back to the book. If the book is not holy, then your life is not going to be holy. If this book is defiled, how then can you follow the will of God perfectly? You can't. So, again in Joshua 24, Joshua 24 verse 19, Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Now, that's not something that God is saying to you. How can I say this? God was mad one day. And God had had it with Israel and God said, God's not going to forgive your sins. But you need to understand that God is holy. 1 Samuel 2, verse 2. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. God is not, if he's the most high, he is also the most holy. The most holy. None is holy as the Lord. Isaiah 43, 3, for I am the Lord thy God. The holy, it's God's name. God's, one of the names of God in the Bible is the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. Isaiah 54, 5, for thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. I mean, look at all these names here. Number one, Maker. Capital M. That's a name for God. Thine husband. So he's your creator, he's your husband, he's your Lord. He is your Redeemer. So what we got? One, two, three, four with Redeemer. The Holy One of Israel, number five. The God of the whole earth shall be called. There's six titles in this one verse here. That not only names God, but it describes the attributes of God as well. He's your maker. He's your husband. He's the Lord of hosts. It means that he controls all the angels, both good and bad. He's your redeemer. He's the one that saves you. He's the Holy One of Israel. He's the God of the whole earth. Shall he be called? That means that every nation in the world is directed to serve only one God. So let me explain myself here. Is it okay that we serve the God of this Bible, but other nations don't have to serve this God? They can serve another God. Is that okay with God? No. He's, that's what that means. The God of the whole earth means that everybody under the heaven in earth is obligated to serve God and only God. He's the God of the whole earth. Mark chapter 1 verse 24. Let us alone. Oh, look at this. Even the devils of hell know who this is. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now, look at that verse. In fact, let me get my little pen out here. Let me circle this. The Holy One of God is Jesus. So if we go back to the Old Testament, for I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. So the, for all the Jehovah's Witness that might be listening to us, who don't believe that Jesus is God. Isaiah 43, 3 calls the Lord Jehovah, the Holy One. Mark chapter 1, verse 24 calls Jesus the Holy One of God. So 
Is it possible that Jesus can be the Holy One but not be God? The answer is no. The same God that you see in the Old Testament, who is the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, is the same God that even the devils recognized that he was the Holy One of Israel. They knew he was God. They knew he was God. Even though they would try to lie to everybody else, when they were facing Jesus, they knew he was God. And they knew he was holy as well. Acts 2, 27. Here it is, says it again. But th because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So what do we believe this verse is talking about? This verse tells us then that in the three days that Jesus lay in the tomb, his body, his physical body that was there did not corrupt. There was no corruption, there was no smell, there was no breakdown of cellular tissue, there was nothing of that. The same body that went into the tomb is the exact same body in the same condition that came out of the tomb. Now apply that also to the Bible. This Bible is the Holy One of God. It, we call it the Holy Bible. Let me get your definition on what the word holy means. What does it mean, somebody? The word holy. Clean. Perfect. Pure. These are all good, and they're, and they're dead on. Huh? Sanctified. Okay? Without... The presence of even the smallest amount of corruption. Without the presence of even the smallest sin. Without the presence of even the smallest mistake. That's how holy God is. That's what the word holy means. If it's designated as being pure, it must be 100% pure. Something cannot be 75% pure. To me, that's kind of, I know how they're, what they're saying, but to me, that's kind of a contradiction. It's 75% pure. Well, if it's pure, it's not 75%. Okay? It's all the way or it's nothing with God. He's the Holy One of God. He would not let His Holy One see corruption. So Christ's body, three days in the tomb, or uh, two days rose again on the third day, did not see any corruption. The Bible does not have corruption in it. Acts 3.14, you denied the Holy One and the just. See, that's linking the two together. Not only is God in holy, is he holy without sin, but God is also perfect in his justice. God has never been unjust one time. You know what that means? He's never done you wrong. Ever. And he never will. God's never made a mistake in his judgment. If God... Earthly judges and earthly courts will condemn a man even to death who was not guilty. That's happened. There are people on death row. There are people in prison right now who were charged for crimes that they did not do. Our legal system is good, but it's not perfect. God's never done that. God has never made that mistake. So when it says he's the holy one and just, that means his justice is also perfect. Desire to murder to be granted unto you. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. I, I'm ru running through some of these very quickly. Oh, turn to Isaiah, turn to Revelation 4. We'll stop here. Isaiah 5.16, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. M several things in these verses. In his judgment. In his righteousness, in his sanctification, in every aspect and in every way, God is pure. God's motives are always pure. His intentions of what he desires to do is always right and always righteous. God never seeks out himself. God always seeks you out. Isaiah 6, 3, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, 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 even in the Old Testament. They were saying it three times. And we know why. Revelation 4 verse 8. Well, I love this phrase. The four beasts had each of them six wings. 
about him and they were full of eyes within. Like that peacock I showed yesterday on Pastor Mike Online. Peacock's tail feathers has eyeballs in it. Okay, it's a picture of this. Their, their wings had eyes in, embedded into them. And they rest not day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy. Now, when I was young and stupid, and I went to Bible college, they, I don't know who made this up, but here's what they taught me. They said, now, in the Greek, in the Greek language, when something is repeated, it intends to show magnification of what it's repeating. Like the word holy. So that was their reasoning for why the word holy was repeated those many times, was that it's holy, holier, and most holy. And that's what it was showing. It was showing magnification of what it was repeating. And at the time, I wasn't really thinking. I thought, oh, okay, that makes sense. Well, that's what my teacher told me. That's what Greek does. And so that must mean, that must be the reason why they said holy three times. And then one day I woke up and I went, wait a minute. I know why they said holy three times. It's three that bear record in heaven. But you got to understand, a lot of the Greek scholars that work on the Greek New Testament nowadays don't believe in the triunity of God. They don't believe in the, in the Godhead or the Trinity. They don't believe in it. And so they had to come up with some other reason why the word holy would be mentioned three times in a row here. So I, I guess it helped them feel better about their doctrine, that they didn't believe in the Godhead, so they said, well, that magnifies the word holy. No. To me, it's real obvious. Holy, holy, holy. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Lord God Almighty, three words, which was, past, is, present, and is to come, future, three tenses. And you have it repeated three times. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, is, is to come. Three times three. I don't think it gets any clearer than that. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So, I mean, technically... And I probably won't do this now, but I could take you all through the Bible and show you Jesus. That Jesus, everything the Bible says about God the Father is applied to God the Son. Jesus is holy. Jesus is everlasting. Jesus is omnipresent. Jesus is omniscient. Jesus, everything that God is, Jesus is. And everything that God and Jesus is, the Holy Spirit is. And yet, they are distinct one from another. Now, ask me to explain it better than that. I can't. Ask me to believe it, and I will. Because that's what my Bible says. Amen? By the way, I'll throw this one at you. 1 John 5, 7 is the verse that says it in no uncertain terms. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And I would challenge anybody. I would challenge anybody. And I would... I would even put a dollar on it. If you could show me a better verse that says in no uncertain terms that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are one God. A verse anywhere in the Bible that says it clearer or as clear as 1 John 5, 7. Do you, George, do you know of a verse that says it better than 1 John? Brother James, do you know of a verse that says it better than 1 John 5, 7? Anybody else? I got a dollar for you. I really do. JR, I'll give you a dollar. Caleb and JR both. I give you 20 bucks a piece if you both can get your heads together and show me a better verse than 1 John 5, 7. 20 bucks a piece. 20 bucks, 20 bucks. That's gas money, right? Okay, smarty. What do you got? Nope. It does not show the Godhead better. I'm going to take $20 out of your wallet just for that stupidity. <laughs> Amen. God's holy. Amen. Even the devils knew it. Even the devils knew who he was. They were scared of him. They were scared of him. And compare... 
You have the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ, versus unclean spirits. Okay? Amen.